Now we each start our individual journey, our individual call to awakening, but as the practice unfolds, there is a shift of understanding when we realize that we are not practicing for ourselves alone. Now, and this is the arising of what is called bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is that motivation and practice or the aspiration that our life and our Dharma journey be for the benefit, for the awakening of all beings. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. In the different Brahma Vihara practices <clears throat> that we've done, we always start with a benefactor. Tonight I'd like to speak of someone who has been a very great benefactor for us all and who in some way has been responsible for us all being here together during this time. I'd like to speak of the meaning and the significance of the Buddha in our lives and in these times. We can understand the meaning of the Buddha on several different levels. We can understand the Buddha as a historical person who was born you know, in the 5th century BC, and he lived um, in a certain town, city of northern India, grew up, all the individual historical circumstances of his life. We can understand the Buddha also as a universal archetype, not just as a particular historical individual, but as an archetype of the fully awakened mind, the potential of that awakening or that enlightenment. And when we understand the Buddha as a human archetype of awakening, we see his life not simply as the strivings and realizations and difficulties of a particular of a particular individual, but we see it, we see all the circumstances of his life as the unfolding of a great mythological journey, a sacred journey. <laughs> now mythological here does not mean unreal. Mythological doesn't mean illusory or imaginary. When we think of the Buddha, the Buddha's life as a sacred mythological journey, mythological means that which universalizes the particular, that which universalizes the individual. So the Buddha is a historical person, Buddha as universal archetype of awakening. The third meaning of the Buddha is that of, we could say, ultimate reality. It's a story of uh, one monk in the Buddha's time <clears throat> entranced by the physical form, the Buddha's physical form. And so he would always, this monk would always be sitting up front and just gazing at the beauty, the physical beauty. After some time, the Buddha reprimanded him. 
He said, you could look at this body, this form, for a hundred years and you would not see the Buddha. Those who see, those who understand the Dharma see the Buddha. And so in this way of understanding, we see that the Buddha is the holy or the fully liberated mind. This has tremendous significance for us because when we realize this, that those who see the Dharma see the Buddha, we realize that Buddha mind, the Buddha, is not outside of ourselves. It is the ultimate nature of our own minds. So where do we look for the Buddha except within ourselves? You know, in coming into the hall, and some of you uh, may bow or pay respects in one way or another, when we bow to the Buddha or pay respects, really it is bowing to love. It's bowing to compassion. It's bowing to wisdom. Because that is the real meaning of Buddha. When we understand the Buddha on all of these levels, historical person, universal archetype, the ultimate realities of experience, we see and we can see his life and the journey of his life revealing the same aspirations that are in our own. And what this does, it helps us put our own life experience, the things that we go through, in a much larger and more profound context. And we begin to find a deeper meaning in our own lives, in our own choices, because we're connecting the Buddha's journey with our own journey. Sometimes, you know, when we contemplate uh, the lives or the experiences of some of the world's great explorers in any field, you know, whether it's the explorers uh, of uncharted territories of the earth or explorers in science, in the arts, in, in whatever, in any field, What makes somebody an explorer is that they are at the forward edge of what is known, the forward edge of discovery. Recently read a book about the Lewis and Clark expedition, you know, which was about the first uh, white Americans traveling across the continent to the Pacific. And this came a lot from the journals of Lewis and Clark, and it was extraordinary. The, you know, crossing thousands of miles of the plains and trying to cross the Rockies in winter, not really knowing where they were going. The hardships that they went through were extraordinary. And it was written in such a, it was written in a way that you really felt you were on the trip with them. Well, we can often appreciate kind of the excitement of a journey of discovery, but we often forget about, you know, the countless difficulties and frustrations and problems and annoyances and inconveniences and everything that is part of that journey. Our practice is just the same way. You know, all the ups and downs that we face in practice and that you've gone through over these months, you know, the countless times of feeling good and then feeling bad or restless or concentrated and just this endless cycle of experience, all of that is part of a much bigger unfolding. And we're really exploring, we're staying at the forward edge of the exploration of our minds. This journey of exploration, 
this journey of awakening, was described in a, a very beautiful way by Joseph Campbell, who was a great student and scholar of world myths and cultures. And he described this sacred mythological journey in a book called Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he used the Buddha's life as the example of this unfolding journey. And it's so interesting because he interweaves the particular experiences of the Buddha's life with the universal principles that they embody. So the first stage of this journey this journey of awakening is called the call to destiny. Call to destiny, the call to awakening. And it happens, well, this arises when something happens in our lives that shakes us up. It makes us question our conventional view, our conventional understanding of ourselves makes us question our lives and what our lives are about. When we realize that ordinary understanding, the worldly understanding of things, finally doesn't satisfy us. The conventions of the world, this conventional understanding, in some way is contained in one verb. And that is the verb to have. The whole world is understood through this verb. I have possessions. I have a body. I have relationships. I have a mind. And our language just keeps supporting this view that somehow we are living in the reality of having things. Eric Fromm, the famous psychologist, he had a little quip. He said, we live with the understanding, I am what I have. You know, and when we look at our experience and our ordinary way of viewing things, it's true. But there's a problem with this. A very serious problem. And that is that whatever we have, whether it's external things, whether we consider we have the body, have a mind state, have a meditative experience, anything that is held in the world of having will be lost. Whatever we have, we will lose. So there's always in this world of having always an underlying sense of unease or anxiety or of incompleteness. If I am what I have, and everything that we have, we'll lose. That's a problem. (laughs) Now, in the early life of the Bodhisattva, who was called the Bodhisattva until his enlightenment, (coughs) this world of having was very strong. He had everything. He was born as a prince into a loving, functional family. (laughs) You know, surrounded by sense pleasures. He had all kinds of worldly knowledge and worldly skills. You know, he had a wonderful relationship. It's like he had everything. And in this this, um, journey that Joseph Campbell describes... And the Bodhisattva's father, the king, you know, embodied all of these worldly values of having. And his father wanted the Bodhisattva just to continue in the family tradition, to grow up and 
keep having things, become king one day. These are the same values that are so prevalent in our own society. Now, how much of our own culture, our own understanding is about having? Well, for the Prince Siddhartha, this call to destiny, the call to awakening, arose when he confronted some basic, basic facts, facts of life. Now, he began to question those values deeply when he came face to face with what are called the heavenly messengers. Now, what are these heavenly messengers? They're the realities of disease, of old age, of death, of suffering. Said that the Buddha, the Bodhisattva at this time, reflected, why should I, being subject to decay and death, also seek that which is subject to decay and death? It's a very basic question confronting us all. Why should we, being subject to decay and death, also go on seeking endlessly those things which are also going to disappear, to change, to decay and die? Why do we keep staying on this wheel of becoming? It really raises the question for each one of us, just as it did for him, What is the real value in our lives? What is really of value? There are three great contemplations on death which can help awaken in us this call to destiny. You know, when we make that transition from an intellectual appreciation of the Dharma, to thinking and even believing or having faith, yes, this is good, to that sense of a compelling spiritual urgency. The first is reflecting on the inevitability of death. It's so amazing how the mind can know and understand, yes, that everybody dies, and yet it's very rare that we actually internalize that and reflect that this will happen to me also. It's always other people who seem to be dying. (laughs) You'd think we'd get it. (laughs) But it really takes, it, it takes reflecting, it takes... Really seeing it, bringing it, bringing it back home for each one of us. There's the reflection on the uncertainty of time of death. You know, even if we somehow have made it real for ourselves, it's certainly not tonight. You know, or probably not tomorrow. But really we don't know. And the third reflection which awakens the spiritual ardency that supports or helps arouse this call to destiny is the understanding that at the time of death, it's only our Dharma practice, or we could say it's only the practice or cultivation of our hearts and minds which will be of any value to us. Anything else we've done in terms of accumulation or accomplishment or gain or fame or whatever at the time of death is meaningless. The only thing that's of value is the level of understanding, of wisdom, of compassion, of love, of equanimity. These are the things which will be of value at the time of death. And so reflecting on this, 
not as something for somebody else, but for meaning in our own lives, it arouses this ardency. So for the Bodhisattva, these questions aroused in him the energy and effort of countless past lifetimes of practice. Now, what is the nature of birth and death? What is it that's born? What is it that, that dies? Now, what are we doing with our lives? What choices are we making? It's the question of what this whole process of life is about. Now, many of us have this passing thought. These questions may arise in our lives, but can so easily, we get so easily re-immersed in the busyness of our lives. What is the nature of birth and death? What is it that is not born and so never dies? Now, each one of us here has had some powerful call to awakening. I mean, this stage of the journey has already happened. It's what brings us all here. I was thinking just in thinking of this talk, remembering some experiences uh, from earlier on in my life, which uh, was really about this stage, you know, of waking up to other possibilities. And I was thinking of a time I was a freshman in college and I was burning, burning with the question of whether God exists as only a college freshman could be. (laughs) And I remember at a certain point it was so compelling and such a burning issue for me, I decided, I gave myself a week to decide. (laughs) Okay, in one week I'm going to (laughs) know. And then I remember I was after college, I was in the Peace Corps, I was in Thailand. And again, this was just a whole period where This call to destiny, the call to awakening was was percolating, was bubbling. And I remember being in the Peace Corps in Bangkok, really with a kind of desperation to know who was on the inside of all this. You know, this person going through all the actions and interactions, and yet not having a clue as to really who it was that was doing all this. And that strong urge to find out, to connect. And one time I was, I had been back to America and I was going back to India to practice. And I I think it was in Israel at the time. I stopped and I saw a movie, uh, the name of it was Charlie. I don't know if you remember it. It was based on a book called Flowers for Algernon. It was really an amazingly moving movie for me because it was about somebody who was mentally retarded. And then I forget they either had medication or some drug. Uh, and he became brilliant. You know, he kind of just went to the other extreme. But then they found out that it was not a lasting remedy. And so the last part of the movie was his again going back, you know, to that uh, level of uh, retardation. But what struck me in the movie was it depicting really how cruel people were in relating to him, you know, with his mental dullness. People with all kinds of practical jokes. and, And when I saw that movie and it was right in the beginning of my spiritual practice, it just reflected in myself what I felt was this tremendous absence of metta. And seeing how easily you know, it was for me to be 
if not cruel, at least often indifferent to people. And that awakened in me this inspiration to do the metta practice. When I got to India, that was the first time that I asked my teacher, uh, I wanted to do that. I wanted to learn, okay, how can I open the heart more? So all of these things, you know, it's like they wake us up from our usual way of being in the world. This is the call to destiny, the call to awakening. Reflecting each one of us, you know, on what this call was for us really can inspire the practice. It reconnects us with the source of inspiration. The second stage of the journey after the call, call to awakening, call to destiny, it's called the great renunciation. In order to awaken to the hidden possibilities of life, to the hidden possibilities of understanding, we need to renounce, we need to be willing to give up our ordinary or conventional way of viewing things. Things are often not what they seem to be. And if we stay just on the surface, we are often living in ignorance, in in illusion. Just one simple example of this is, I think it was last year, you know, through that great Hubble telescope uh, up in the sky, uh, they were ta- they were taking pictures of the sky in an area around the uh, Big Dipper. And I don't have the numbers exactly right, but it'll give you some idea. It was in a part of the sky where previously... Previous to looking through this telescope, they didn't think anything was there. And then they looked through the telescope, and they found, and I hear I'm not sure of the exact number, but something like 50 billion galaxies. <laughs> you know, in this part of the sky where they thought nothing was there, all of a sudden 50 billion galaxies appear. <laughs> You think there's a possibility we're missing something? (laughs) The same thing happens when we turn inward. I'd like to read you something. This is about turning inward just on a physical level, not to speak of the vastness, the domain of consciousness. This was from a book on sort of new discoveries in quantum physics, which don't ask me anything about, but this is the quotation. (laughs) In very round terms, the quantum world operates on a scale as much smaller than a sugar cube as a sugar cube is compared with the entire observable universe. (laughs) I'm not not understanding any of that, but just the, the, the sugar cube compared to the entire observable universe. Big! (laughs) (laughs) The quantum level of things is in that same relationship to the to the cube. So, what is this that we are calling, you know, my body, this thing that we think we are? There are such mysteries and such vastness, which normally we just don't pay attention to. <coughs> it's really the renunciation of having this verb to have. It's the renunciation of that as our deepest value. And we turn our attention much more to the nature of the mind itself, to the quality of being, not to what we have. And we see that how we are, the quality of our being, 
has much more to do with our happiness than anything we might have or possess. <coughs> and we begin to see that <clears throat> how we are is up to us. There is actually this potential to open the heart, to awaken the mind. And this renunciation doesn't only happen externally. It's not only about giving up things. We can see it very clearly right in the context of this retreat. Letting go of discursive thoughts. Do we just sit here and indulge them? Or can we, because we're having a nice thought, you know, or we're having a future plan, or we're having something or other, as long as we don't renounce that having, we get lost. We get immersed in that world. Can we actually renounce that having and simply drop into that place of being where we see all of these things simply arising and passing? It's really renouncing discursive thoughts, renouncing our distractions. So the great renunciation, this is the second stage of the journey. And being on this retreat, this is already a significant level of the experience of renunciation. We've all given up a lot you know, in being here. And it gives us a taste of what this stage of the journey is about. You know, for the Bodhisattva, he left the palace, he left his family. He left his interests, he left the busyness of the world, and he went off and studied with different teachers. He studied all the jhanas, you know, all the levels of absorption. He did six years, as it said, of these very austere ascetic practices, really torturing the body in an attempt to subdue the mind. Six years. You know, this is six weeks or three months in comfortable surroundings. Tremendous power there, tremendous uh, inspiration. But after that time, he saw that wasn't the way, it wasn't the path. So he gave that up. He took some nourishment for the body. And he prepared himself for the third great event in the sacred journey. And that third event is called the great struggle. This is the call to destiny, the call to awakening, that which awakens in us the aspiration. There's the great renunciation, the great struggle. Joseph Campbell described this in a very mythopoetic language, which I'd like to read to you. This is the Bodhisattva under the Bodhi tree, confronting Mara, you know, all the forces of illusion, of ignorance. So try to visualize this you know, as I read it, because the imagery is quite uh, magnificent. The Bodhisattva placed himself with a firm resolve beneath the Bodhi tree, and straight away was approached by Kamamara, the god of desire and death. The dangerous god appeared mounted on an elephant, carrying weapons in his thousand hands. Thousand hands. He was surrounded by his army, which extended twelve leagues before, twelve to the right, twelve to the left, and to the rear, as far as the confines of the world. It was nine leagues high. The protecting deities of the universe took flight. <laughs> but the future Buddha remained unmoved beneath the tree. And then the god assailed him, seeking to break his concentration. Whirlwind, rocks, thunders, and flame, smoking weapons with keen edges, 
burning coals, hot ashes, boiling mud, blistering sands, and fourfold darkness Mara hurled against the Bodhisattva. But the missiles were all transformed into celestial flowers and ointments by the power of Gotama's ten perfections. Mara then deployed the force of desire and lust, but the mind of the great being was not distracted. The god finally challenged the Bodhisattva's right to be sitting where he was, and he flung his razor-sharp discus angrily and bid the towering host of the army to let fly at the Bodhisattva with mountain crags. But the future Buddha only moved his hand to touch the ground with his fingertips and thus bid the goddess Earth bear witness to his right to be sitting where he was. The goddess Earth did so with a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand roars, so that the elephant of Mara fell upon its knees in obeisance to the future Buddha. The army was immediately dispersed, and the gods of all the world scattered garlands. Well, every time we sit, it's as if we're sitting under the Bodhi tree. No, we're sitting confronting faces, facing all the forces of Mara, all the forces of illusion. Now, as we sit with desire and fear and doubt and restlessness and anger and hatred, and boredom. It's the same great struggle. We're sitting under our own Bodhi tree. And what's so important, I think, is to realize that our own struggles have a much greater meaning than the immediate experience. Because they're part of this sacred unfolding journey. It's part of a much larger unfolding. Every time we sit and we're facing these forces of our own minds, it's the same situation that the Bodhisattva was in under the Bodhi tree. Thomas Merton wrote something quite... uh, apt and beautiful about the nature of this great struggle, the stage of the journey. Merton wrote that prayer and love are learned in the hour when prayer becomes impossible and the heart has turned to stone. Now if we just substitute there for a moment meditation. Meditation and love are learned in the hour when meditation becomes impossible and the heart has turned to stone when there's no love at all. That's when these things are learned. This is really the meaning of courageous effort. It's that willingness to open to it all, to explore it all. There's no way that our practice is not going to include a meeting of all of these forces that the the Bodhisattva met under the tree. Now in Pali, uh, the word virya, which is often translated as effort, I think sometimes that translation leads us to misunderstanding because Effort wrongly understood really just involves us or can involve involve us with expectation, with ambition, with tension, maybe with pride or discouragement. If we fit some model that we have of effort or we don't fit it, and when we do, we get proud, and when we don't fit it, we get discouraged. You know, a model of how our practice should be. But virya can be understood in a whole different way. And the translation that I like the most is that of a courageous heart. 
It's that heart or that courage that doesn't retreat from difficulties, that doesn't give up in the face of difficulties. Sometimes we need to find balance, but it's that heart which is always seeking to understand. And so at this stage of the journey, the great struggle, the question for us is can we generate this courage, this courageous heart, not from some external model of how we should be, but can we generate this courage from within ourselves? You know, from our own interest, our own willingness, our own passion to understand. It's this courage which allows us and keeps us playing at the edge, that edge of exploration, the edge of discovery. Often when it's uncomfortable, when we don't want to be there. Because it's when we're at the edge of what is known, that's when new experience, new possibilities open us, open up. And it's different for each one of us. You know, we've spoken a lot at different times of our teacher Deepama, who had extraordinary virya. And she was this tiny woman. <laughs> with a heart that was huge. So one day, it was, it was one of the last times I saw her, we were walking, we were in Bodh Gaya, and it's like she came up to my waist. You know, and so I'm up here, and she's down here. And she kind of turned to me and she said, I think you should sit for two days. And she didn't mean like a two-day retreat. She meant sit down and get up two days later. (laughs) Because she herself had often done that. And at one time, she sat for four days in one, in one, so a four day sit. (laughs) So when she said this to me, sit for two days, I just started laughing because it seemed totally beyond what I could even imagine. You know, and so I just started laughing a little bit, and she turned to me and said, "Don't be lazy." <laughs> well, I never did do that two days said, but it was just amazing, just as as an example of even in our minds, even if we just consider the possibility of not being confined by our limitations. So what does courageous effort mean now, you know, for you in your practice? In this stage of the great, the great struggle, you know, there's the call to awaken and the call to destiny, which brings us here. There's the great renunciation, giving up our usual way of being and viewing the world then the great struggle as we really face ourselves and all the forces of conditioning within us that go so deep. What does this courageous heart mean? You know, for each one of us, and what will it mean when you leave here and out in the world? What choices you know, will we make? So the last stage of the sacred journey that we're all on is called the Great Awakening. And for the Buddha, it happened in three different, what are called the watches of the night, three different sections of the night. In the first one, this is the night of his enlightenment, in the first watch of the night, he saw all of his innumerable past lives, and just the insubstantiality of them, and the endlessness of being born in this situation and growing old and having all kinds of experiences, dying, being reborn, over and over and over again. And just think of how a perspective would change on things if we had that vision of just seeing the endlessness 
of life and death and rebirth and life and death and rebirth over and over again. Well, we can get a taste of that when we look at our past experiences in this life. Now, even if we don't can't see past lives, we can see what it's like in this very life, all our past experience, where are they? Now, endless numbers of them. We see their emptiness, their insubstantiality. There's nothing much there. And so then the question arises, what are we holding on to? More experiences of the same? In the second watch of the night, it said that he penetrated or open to the understanding of the law of karma. He saw the destiny of beings, that because of certain actions, being beings being reborn in various happy planes or planes of suffering. And the compassion that arose from seeing that everybody wanted to be happy and yet out of ignorance was doing the very things that cause suffering that brought suffering. We can see this so clearly in our own lives. You know, we all want to be happy. And yet in those times of delusion, those times of being asleep, we so often do the very things which bring about suffering. In the third watch of the night, be open to the Four Noble Truths. That precise understanding of suffering and how the mind creates it and freedom and the way to that freedom. Now, and it said that at daybreak, just as the morning star appeared, that he attained, he awakened to full enlightenment. As the very famous quotation of words that he uttered at that time. Imagine, imagine the moment. It must have been an incredible moment. And these are these were his first words, according to the teachings. I traveled through the rounds of countless births, seeking but not finding the builder of this house. Sorrowful is birth again and again and again. O oh, house builder, you have now been seen. You shall build no house again. Your rafters, that is the defilements, have been broken. Your ridge pole, that's that center pole on the roof, your ridge pole shattered, the ridge pole of ignorance. Mind has attained to unconditioned freedom. Achieved is the end of craving. Just for a moment. Realize or imagine or drop back into that mind of no craving. Achieved is the end of craving. The mind liberated through that. This is actually what we're practicing. We're practicing that same liberation that the Buddha experienced. Now he was enlightened. This happened at the age of 35. And he spent time around the Bodhi tree, it said, in various contemplations. And then he began, after I think it was seven weeks, six or seven weeks, when he was contemplating uh, some of the books of the Abhidharma, there's one story, teaching, account of how when he was contemplating this one particular book of the Abhidharma, book of relations, which is said to be you know, perhaps the most profound or subtle, that this rainbow colored light was emanating from his body because of the profundity of the understanding. Anyway, after the six or seven weeks, he traveled to Sarnath, which is a place just outside of Benares where he met up with the five ascetics that he had been doing the ascetic practices with, and he gave the first teaching. 
I mentioned it earlier in the retreat. It's called, it's the first discourse called setting the wheel of the Dharma in motion. That was his first teaching after his awakening. And in it, he talked about the four noble truths. He talked about selflessness. In it, he laid the foundation for the remaining 45 years of his life, of his teaching. In quite a short time, he had 60 disciples who were fully enlightened, who were arhans. And when he had 60 disciples who had fully realized the Dharma, this is what he said to them. I think this is a very important uh, juncture, you know, in the teachings. The Buddha said to these 60 disciples, Go forth, O bhikkhus, for the good of the many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the good, the benefit, the happiness of people and devas. Teach the Dharma, excellent in the beginning, excellent in the middle, excellent in the end. Proclaim the noble life, altogether perfect and pure. Work for the good of others, you who have done your duty. Now we each start our individual journey, our individual call to awakening. But as the practice unfolds, there is a shift of understanding when we realize that we are not practicing for ourselves alone. Now, and this is the arising of what is called bodhijitta. Bodhijitta is that motivation and practice or the aspiration that our life and our Dharma journey be for the benefit, for the awakening of all beings. And we start out or we, we do our practice often out of compassion, compassion for our own suffering, then compassion for the suffering of others. We do our practice out of a feeling of interconnectedness with other beings. But I think it's also important to be very realistic and down to earth about bodhicitta. I read something the Dalai Lama said. I cannot pretend that I am really able to practice bodhicitta, but it does give me tremendous inspiration. Deep inside, I realize how valuable and beneficial it is. That is all. Okay, this is the Dalai Lama. (laughs) I cannot pretend that I'm really able to practice bodhicitta. What I think is important here is that we can be cultivating the aspiration to have the aspiration of bodhicitta. You know, so even if we feel, yeah, that's a good idea, but that's not me. You know, I'm not really able to practice for the benefit of all. I'm dealing with my knee pain. That's fine. You know, I don't think we should create some kind of idealistic picture of ourselves and our practice. But to understand, to appreciate the beauty, the tremendous beauty, and just to nurture that, just that we're practicing or watering that seed within us. Yes, this is important. Now let me hold it tenderly. Let me see if I can nurture this seed of bodhicitta within ourselves. it really can become a very great inspiration for our own efforts. You 
in every moment that we free ourselves from the prison of self, you know, from the fetter of attachment and craving, from this feeling of I and mine, in every moment, even if it's just for a moment that we can do this, the very nature of awareness manifests its its very natural love and compassion. That love and compassion, that bodhicitta, can be right there in that moment, free of the sense of self. There was a, a wonderful and great teacher in India. It was Ramdas's guru, Neem Karoli Baba, um, who expressed something that is very basic in many spiritual paths, but he just encapsulated it in one very simple phrase. He said, don't throw anyone out of your heart. And over the years, I've seen this, that this can really become the bottom line reference point for our practice and our lives. Don't throw anyone out of your heart, because if we hold this as the reference point, then it reflects back to us every time where we do feel separate. Times when we separate out, when we do keep people out, it really reveals that to us, it shows us, it illuminates it. So we practice this non-separation in two different ways. One way we practice, as we've been doing, through the cultivation of metta, of compassion, starting with ourselves, benefactor, friend, neutral person, enemy, all beings. Don't throw anyone out of your heart. So we just make our heart very big, including everybody. You know, we do it as a path, as a practice. There's another way. We come to this, and that's through the realization of selflessness. Because then we realize there's no one there to keep anybody out. And this, for me, is the great union of love and wisdom. They're really aspects of the same thing. We see that our feelings of metta, of loving kindness, are the expression of selflessness. And in the genuine experience of emptiness of self, there is automatically metta and compassion because there's no separation. Tulku Urgin, who was a great Tibetan master of this century, just died uh, recently. He spoke of this in terms of relative and absolute bodhicitta. And so he said, we practice relative bodhicitta as the compassionate wish to awaken all beings. Now that we cultivate this compassion for the suffering all beings, to free beings from suffering, ourselves included. And we practice absolute bodhicitta with the wisdom of emptiness. That is the wisdom of understanding that there are no beings there to awaken. Until Kaurgan said, with these two, with compassion and wisdom, enlightenment is unavoidable. <laughs> This is really the great perfection of love and wisdom, compassion and wisdom. These are the two great wings of the Dharma. There's the call to destiny. That which awakens us from our sleep of conventional understanding. There's the great renunciation, the willingness to give up our habitual, habituated views of things. 
there's the great struggle, the connection with that courageous heart that is actually willing to face ourselves, to face the deepest tendencies and conditioning in our mind. And there's the great awakening, the perfection of wisdom and compassion. I'd like to close with the last words of the Buddha. Just imagine his lifetimes in the cultivation of these qualities of Buddhahood. 45 years of teaching. He's about to die. These are the last words that he said. So, Listen carefully. (laughs) I mean, clearly they were considered words. With the light of perfect wisdom, illuminate the darkness of ignorance. Subject to decay are all conditioned things. Practice with heedfulness. Practice with diligence. With the light of perfect wisdom, illuminate the darkness of ignorance. Subject to decay are all conditioned things. Practice with heedfulness. They're really words of great compassion. Let's sit for a few minutes. (laughs) 